So I'm uh, happy to announce to you, next to me is uh, Ji Wei. He's uh, Vice General Manager of Tianjin Mainland Hydrogen Equipment. Good to have you here, Mr. Xu. Your applause. <laughs> Welcome also to uh, Wolfgang Chen. He is General Manager of Palkan Energy Corporation. And uh, opposite of me is Franz Lehner. He is Managing Consultant at E4 Tech. Come on, Mr. Lehner, get up. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Ulrich Walter, by the way. I'm going to be the moderator. Okay, <laughs> good to have you all here. Very well. Um, I start this discussion, and uh, whenever you have a question, just raise your hand. I'll be with you that uh, we can take your questions directly. Um, Mr. Lena, E4Tech is an international consulting firm and focusing on sustainable energy, including electrified vehicles. As we all know, China is the leading market for e-vehicles, so you're probably quite often over there, aren't you? Um, yeah, so as a company, E4Tech has been, I think, there with six trips in the last 12 months. Um, a lot is going on in fuel cells and hydrogen, which is one of our core areas. So we are a team of 25 people, so it's, it's really difficult to follow everything um, very closely. So far, for example, thanks to our uh, annual um, fuel cell industry review, which is also being read in China, we are getting quite good access to meet the companies on site. Um, but the last two to three years have really been very dramatic in terms of how many new companies have entered in China. So it's, it's quite challenging to, to track the developments. Um, but so far, um, it's, it's very encouraging for us to see how, how quickly and, and, and serious the developments are over there. Dramatic is a good word for this, yes. <laughs> really evolving very, very quickly. Mr. Xu, uh, Tianjin Mainland Hydrogen Equipment is an electrolyzer manufacturer for alkaline high-pressure electrolyzers, PEM electrolyzers, and large-scale hydrogen plants. Your main market is in China, or uh, are you internationally uh, available? Well, the uh, main market now is in China according to the contract uh, amount. But also, we because we have... a uh, uh, partners, for example, in Europe, so our equipment also exported to Europe and also around the uh, 30 countries around the world. But the hydrogen that you produce with your electrolyzers are mainly for industry, isn't it? Industry uh, applications. Uh, yes, we uh, call it uh, traditional market, it's mainly uh, for uh, chemical uh, raw material or something like that. Um, but now things, two or three years, things change. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's another big market in mobility for you. We'll talk about that. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chen, I always thought Palkan is a Chinese company, but your headquarters, R&D and finance is based in Canada. Explain that to me, please. Yeah, actually... Uh, Parkan was founded in 1998 in Canada, but uh, always mm -hmm. there is a problem with the hydrogen supply chain. So later we moved to China, we had to make projects, and later we found that Mesano reforming to get hydrogen is one of the solutions. So we are now focusing on Mesano reformed, then higher temperature, so fuel, fuel cell systems. And you, you aim at the market in Canada or in China? So the market is uh, China for sure. Four years ago, when I was here, talk about the fuel cell has good opportunity in China. At that time, four years ago, uh, people is doubting about that. But now we see China is starting to do something. And, and your application of fuel cell applications for small transport vehicles, for uh, backup power, and portable fuel cell applications mainly, yeah? Yeah, yes. Mm. OK. So the stage is open. Whenever you have a question to one of my uh, uh, panelists, just uh, raise your hand. Uh, I start with Mr. Lena. Um, we all know due to air pollution problems in, in Chinese big cities, they uh, really early went to a battery electric vehicle strategy policy. They were very strict about uh, giving uh, their, their, their uh, plates, their, their car plates to, to people uh, who are not electrically driven. But funny enough, uh, it has changed recently a little bit towards fuel cell electricity. Why that? I think in better electric vehicles, they had a huge success over the last 10 years. So it's now time to slowly reduce the, the subsidies and instead introduce um, quota for how many EVs you have to sell uh, during the year. Fuel cell electric vehicles um, came 
came into the mix in 2016, 17. And um, what we more and more understand is that Toyota's Mirai launch in 2014, 15 was part of, of what triggered this decision at the governmental level. So they looked at Japan and, and, and saw if, if they're going fuel cell electric, that must be something serious. We should not lose out on that. Um, so they embrace it as an opportunity. And it's not only Toyota Mirai launch, but also the, the whole Japanese commitment at large uh, for, for, um, for fuel cell industry. Yes. So, so air pollution continues to be a driver, but also um, there are problems you can't address with, with battery electric vehicle alone. Um, so range and heavy duty is one topic, but also recharging in, in, in mega cities um, is, is a problem. So um, they see that it's complementary. And at the same time, from a, in a point of, of industry policy, it's an opportunity for economic growth. So they have nothing really to lose in internal combustion engines. They're not exporting to the world in huge amounts like we do in Europe. So they can embrace fuel cells as an opportunity, whereas here in Europe, we sometimes think, well, mm, maybe we, we have a way to just continue with our internal combustion engine. For the Chinese, it's a much more dynamic environment because they're not holding on to something. They are embracing the new. Right. Mr. Chen, I, I just can't really believe that China is learning something from Japan. Is that possible? Is that thinkable? <laughs> it's always. China it's learned always. from war to war. <laughs> Okay, so you, you, you're watching the world and the, you take the best uh, that you find in the world. And you take it very quickly, don't you? Uh, I think this is uh, somehow the culture. China is working very hard and uh, they spend time. If you spend time, you could learn something. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Xu, if China is really looking towards hydrogen mobility, a lot of hydrogen will be needed. So a lot of electrolyzers will be needed. Or what do you think? Yeah, uh, I think it's uh, like uh, that. Uh, uh, China now is the world largest uh, importer of uh, crude oil and uh, also the largest uh, new vehicle market. And uh, China, many uh, hydrogen uh, production every year about uh, 22 million tons, about one third of the whole world. The world's uh, production, so, yeah. Yeah, so, 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 so we see it as uh, uh, hydrogen as a, a solution of air pollution and also hydrogen have the uh, national energy security. That may be one solution. But Mr. Chu, 22 million tons of hydrogen yeah. are not produced green. They are probably all come from coal and uh, from uh, uh, gas reformers, don't they? Uh, actually, uh, more than 60 of the hydrogen is from uh, coal. And uh, 20, around the 20 percent percentage is from uh, natural gas. And uh, about one percentage is from uh, water electrolysis. So the main hydrogen is from fossil fuel. Well, so I, I missed 19 percent. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Where's well, the rest from? Uh, that, that, that's uh, some uh, uh, byproduct of uh, yeah, recover from. Uh, yeah, yeah. I yeah, understand. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, but then we have the problem like the battery electric vehicles in China. People say, in Europe, for instance, the OEMs say, well, our diesels here in Europe are cleaner than your battery electric vehicles in, in China because the, the energy comes from coal. Well, uh, uh, because we are also... Uh, there is... Uh, China is very, 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 very big. So there is some area that uh, uh, have a lot of wind, and uh, some area have a lot of uh, hydropower. And now the, 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 the energy just uh, waste, uh, because uh, that energy you cannot uh, directly into the grid, because it's not uh, stable. And so, it's, it's far away. Uh, These areas are right in the uh, west uh, and uh, yeah, not in the east uh, where it's needed. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Uh -huh. so, so the 
renewable energy, hydrogen, hydrogen to electricity, maybe like that. And China is very, also very strong in your renewables. They are promoting renewables very much, don't they? Uh, yes, I think it is mainly about the, 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 the government policy. If you have the policy, then uh, you can have uh, financial support. Actually, when you're talking to the end customer of hydrogen, what they really care about is the cost of your hydrogen. It, it, it's, it's, it's like that. <laughs> it's, it's already the market, but you have to come down with the, with the cost, of course, yeah. Mr. Chen, but you say it's, it's not hydrogen. The future will be methanol. Why are you so sure about that? Uh, actually, methanol and hydrogen, they are brothers. You should see, in the future, there should be many kinds of different uh, technology. They are existing together. So pure lithium battery, plus hydrogen as a ranging standard or as a hybrid, or methanol working together is possible. And from the viewpoint about energy saving or energy storage, super caps are for several minutes to hours, lithium battery are for one day to one week, and hydrogen could be for one month to one year, and methanol could be for one to 10 years. So between methanol and hydrogen, the only bridge is CO2. By producing methanol, by storage energy, you reduce the CO2. So from long term of view, you could see the future, there will be a good energy carrier. This is uh, methanol, he is uh, energy carrier, he is also hydrogen carrier. And you have to know that methanol is quite common in China because people cook on methanol, don't they? Yeah, in China, methanol has two big channels. One channel is a chemical product. Another channel is a fuel. People use methanol in China to heat, to use the heat. People also use methanol for ICA, for the uh, motor to bend it. So in China, the government encourages people to buy methanol car and to build methanol stations. But how, how do you get the methanol then? You go to the supermarket and get a canister of methanol out there? Or it's possible if you uh, want to have hot pot at home, you could buy the methanol for personal using. But, but in the in near future, you will have refueling stations with methanol. Yeah, in China, there's more and more fueling stations. For example, in the city Xi'an, there is uh, more than 4,000 and a plan for 10,000 uh, uh, taxis with methanol motor. So there is already more than 20 fueling stations. Such kind of pure methanol station will be more and more in China. Quite interesting, Mr. Lina. And the, the government policy is towards fuel cell vehicles and they cut the funding for battery electric vehicles by 50%, I've learned, and now it's, it's getting... Uh, the better support for fuel cell uh, vehicles. That's, that's impressive. I think the government thinks that they are now at the stage where they can reduce the subsidies for better electric vehicles without... Already, when we start thinking about it, yes. It, uh, without Europe. harming the industry. Um, and for fuel cells, at least what we hear is for the next two to three years, we could expect um, a relatively stable environment to continue scaling up the industry. But at some point, also the fuel cell industry will have to face uh, declining subsidies, and um, the Chinese sure. are very um, pragmatic about it. If, if the technology cost can't be reduced as expected, then, well, then it didn't work, but I think they're putting enough money in. They are talking about tenfold more production volumes every five years, so really very aggressive numbers, and that's exactly what we need to see in fuel cell technology. If you go to high volumes, we can reduce the cost. It's not anymore about technology breakthroughs that need to be achieved. And it's easy in Chinese market with that uh, support from the government to get to the high volumes qu quite, quite quickly. Yeah? Absolutely, yes. And um, this policy from the Ministry of Science and Technology is, is dedicated to the vehicles. So far, we have seen not a lot of attention towards where the hydrogen comes from. 
And I also think it's not so important for the next two to three years because it's not so many vehicles, they're not consuming that much energy. Um, I think that will come at a later stage to think about renewable hydrogen. And if you look at the economic growth the last 20 years in China, they had to build everything to generate the power they needed. But they've also built not just coal and, and nuclear, they've built a lot of wind and PV. Um, and so 10 years from now, if, if that growth continues, then the Chinese grid electricity will also be way greener than today. I would like to invite you, if you have any questions to my panelists, just raise your hand. I come right with, to you with your questions, no problem. But there's none at the moment. So just tell me, Mr. Lena, you, you've just been to an, uh, uh, um, a factory in, in China and seen uh, 3,000 uh, buses and trucks uh, are being built, uh, not so many on the road. So over 2017, 18, the official number of manufactured vehicles is around 3,000 combined for the two years. Um, but it is impressive to come to factories where you see the number of trucks or buses that are there are exceeding what we are talking about in Europe over several years. Um, so they just do it and then um, because they do it so fast, quite often they run into problems. Um, there's no refueling station or there's no um, licensing um, for, the, for the vehicles and it takes time to get the vehicles into operation. But at the same time, if, if you think about it, they decided to go for fuel systems two, th three years ago and now you can see in Shanghai how these trucks are being refueled one after another, queuing to be refueled. Um, it's quite amazing. So, yeah. It, but but it, that's, it seems to be the way to do it in China, Mr. Chu. Uh, you, you just say, well, let's build 3,000 buses, and then let's see what will be the problems we will solve it then. Is that the way of thinking? It's not this project thinking that we have in Europe and everything must be fixed before we only start to get the first thing done? Well, uh, I think uh, uh, just uh, uh, for example, our we make a hydrogen generator, water electrolysis. Uh, originally, it, it is uh, used for for traditional market, and uh, for our end customer, when we supply our equipment, we commission then. They, they get some certificate from the government, then they can operate uh, no problem. Uh, only recently, two of our, our end users, they use our hydrogen generator for, for hydrogen refueling station. After we commission our uh, equipment, then, then they stopped because they do not uh, have the certificate uh, from the government. Mm -hmm. Because this is very, very new, and uh, we have some uh, uh, a regulation that uh, the hazard chemical uh, production and uh, storage must be in a chemical production park. But the hydrogen refueling station generally do not locate it uh, in, 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 in that area. So we, we so because things is very fast, they, they, they already buy the, 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 the equipment, they, they, they just cannot run. And uh, uh, last month, uh, our Prime Minister uh, uh, mentioned a hydrogen refueling uh, facility uh, in his uh, annual work report to the uh, People's uh, 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 Congress, National People's Congress, uh, that we will, I think, have a top level policy designer to solve all this. So, so the, pr the stop the problems with certification, yes? Uh, certification, yeah. and also there is a saying that uh, 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 hydrogen not only regarded as chemical hazard, but also regarded as energy. So, uh, like a natural gas, uh, something like that. So, And when it's, it's regarded as natural gas, it comes to another ministry probably then? Well... To the housing ministry? Uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, when they uh, apply for a certificate, they don't know which uh, government department is fully responsible for that. Yeah. 
But I still have to ask, because our imagination is certification in Germany is a big problem, and we hear about that certification of electrolyzers takes around a year uh, here, here in Germany and Europe. The same thing in, in China, I couldn't believe it. It's, I, I always thought, well, you're very quick, you know. It, uh, Sometimes you need to help a little bit uh, to make it quick, but finally it's, it's quick. But it's not. It's, it's, China becomes uh, uh, a little bit like Germany? Well, I think uh, there is some uh, city or there is some uh, province. They already have the uh, two cell vehicles. They are yeah. already run and they already have a, a hydrogen refueling station. It is in uh, their level. The policy is in their level, not uh, the, the central government uh, level. Yeah, yeah. So we need uh, that okay. level policy. Okay, and uh, there's no policy of the, of the, of the uh, whole government, but only from the regional government. Uh, yeah, yeah, I yeah. understand. Okay, I come to you if you introduce yourself. Hi, this is Michael from Evonik Industries. Um, I would like to know Concerning the next three to five years, how many hydrogen refueling stations do you think will be built in China? And uh, for which corresponding vehicles will it be trucks, buses, or passenger cars? Just to get a feeling also in relations to Europe. It's hard to say, isn't it, Mr. Chen? Could you answer on that? How many refueling stations in the next 25 years that are eons for you, aren't they? So the Chinese um, uh, new energy area uh, when we look back uh, 15 or 20 years ago about the solar, wind, and lithium battery, at the beginning, Chinese always see a very conservative value. For example, 1,000 stations in 2030, and 10,000 stations in 2050. This is, according to my understanding, very conservative, although it's a big number, but still very conservative, because once this process, this chicken and eggs problem is resolved, then people will start to build the fueling station very quickly. So sometimes, or at least, nobody had a belief in that China could produce so many gigawatts solar panel. Nobody could understand why the Chinese could make so many lithium battery, but it happens. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to predict, Ms. Elena. Yeah? The funding policy was for, for buses, trucks, and for passenger cars, and what you have seen is exactly that, that um, the first adopters of the technology were fleet operators for, for the light-duty trucks and for, for buses, um, which makes a lot of sense. You build one refueling station, your vehicles come to the same station again and again. Um, that's easier to roll out than to address the passenger market, um, passenger car market. Um, this is probably something for the 2020s, um, where big OEMs like Great Wall Motors are, are looking to launch fuel cell electric vehicles. And for the next three to five years, probably the focus will be more on the heavy duty applications. And it's uh, in interesting to see, Mr. Chen, you're here the fourth year, as far as I know. Yeah. Yeah. And when you were here on stage four, four years ago, you announced completely different things, you know. <laughs> Nobody in China was talking about fuel cell cars. Uh, uh, but... but uh, Things are changing very quickly in China. Yeah, so China they? is very dynamic. It happens something and it uh, runs very quickly. Indeed. I have a question from Marike Reyelt. Come to you. Hi, Marike. <laughs> Thank you, Uli. Well, uh, Marike Reyelt, European Hydrogen Association. Uh, how are the developments with uh, hydrogen in rail and in inland shipping? I think in uh, Europe we are embarking in these fields as well. Uh, and we were talking actually with Chinese colleagues uh, of, about the dream of making the locks for the uh, road, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, hydrogen locks. So what are the indications in China in these fields? Thank you. Thank you, Marike. Does anybody know? Is there, are there any plans uh, for yeah, trains in, in China. It's not a very strong train system. Oh, yeah, sometimes there is. Yes. Uh, oh, yes. What I know, three years ago, when Astrom had to make the first train in Europe, and the Chinese announced that they had also the fuel cell train in Qingdao. When Europeans say they have this uh, fuel cell airplane 
Charlie's uh, released the same news in two years. <laughs> so I think everything, if there is a target, if something happened in Japan, in Europe, the Chinese would like to say, give them some time, and they will do that the same. So they might build, they might buy one from Alstom and then produce them themselves, yeah? <laughs> That's the way to do it, okay. But the, the second question was the, the inland shipment. Uh, do you, did you hear anything and, and have you strong inland shipment in, uh, in China? Yes, probably you have. Inland shipment? In, inland shipment. Uh, inland shipment. Uh, ship, so ships in, inside uh, on, on the rivers. This is a facility in China might be focused on Mesano to change the fuel of the ships from traditional uh, heavy oil or uh, diesel. First step is uh, to Mesano because it's more e much more easier and cheaper in compared to hydrogen. Because hydrogen, you need a very big power, for example, 100 or 1,000 kilowatts. This is still a little bit too early for the uh, fuel cell industry. But you have to look at methanol. Uh, do you burn it, or is it for fuel cells? Uh, I think for, for shipment, they rather burn it then. Yeah, for ship, I think uh, the German company IMAN is very good, very strong in methanol engine. You have uh, just uh, integrated a methanol range extender into a city bus and a delivery vehicle. Uh, do they also burn the methanol there, or do you have fuel cell in it? Yeah, uh, we are a fuel cell company. We take methanol as the source of hydrogen. So in our bus, uh, in our truck, is uh, methanol in liquid form, and then we reform the methanol to hydrogen. Then we put the hydrogen into the uh, stack, and then we get electricity. So it works well with the trucks. And you have a reformer then uh, yeah. for, for the methanol first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So f you first you take the hydrogen, put it together with methane, make methanol out of it, and then you split it again, you know? It, it's a little bit uh, complicated, isn't it? And loss of efficiency, isn't it? Uh, actually, the efficiency is quite higher. I just give you a number. In 2001, uh, Daimler had made Leica 5 with 38 liter methanol. In the the A-class car could run around 400 kilometers. So the efficiency is quite high. There's another question. Yeah, two more questions. First goes to you. Oh, thank you. Uh, Tsikon is from uh, FPT Industrial. Um, the situation on uh, buses is clear. Numbers were mentioned. Uh, mentioned. What about the passenger uh, cars and uh, light or heavy duty uh, commercial trucks? Do you have uh, indications, numbers to share with us, or uh, the trends that are followed in China? I would like to answer, Mr. Lena. Um, it, it's it's currently really hard to predict because there are so many companies who are active and trying to get vehicles onto the road. Passenger cars, I think, will take a, a few years more because nobody is ready to put them onto the road before there is a refueling infrastructure. Um, the, the targets that are officially communicated by the associations tend to be more on the conservative side. So um, we, we, with, within one or two years, getting to 1,000 per year or 2,000 per year is quite impressive. So um, tens of thousands in the 2020s per year I think is, is the ambition, at least, um, for, for most of the actors in China. But we, we can, at the moment, just follow the news items, and uh, the nice thing in China, usually things actually are happening then. There are, of course, some companies who need to make big announcements to attract investments, and maybe then um, they fall short of those announcements. But cumulatively, there's a lot happening. So, yeah, follow our review, and, and, and we'll report the numbers. Okay, there was a second question over there. Please introduce yourself. Hi, this is uh, Ashish Lele from, from India. Uh, do you think onboard reforming is a good idea given the transients in the drive cycle, uh, particularly onboard reforming of methanol? Is that a good idea? Yeah, there is a lot of technical challenge, but uh, we are improving uh, day by day. So for reformer, there is a lot of uh, work still on that. But uh, technically, it's a good solution. We could uh, do that well. 
Mr. Lena, please. What, what I've observed, again, looking at who is exhibiting here in Hanover, we see companies from China are mainly those that do the electrolyzers. They see a market opportunity in Europe. But we don't see fuel cell companies from China, except uh, yours. <laughs> um, they are very busy addressing the market right now in China. They don't even have time to, to, to bother too much about what's going on here in Europe. Um, but this uh, hydrogen question, um, large-scale electrolysis, is, is a bigger topic in Europe and increasingly globally. So we get a lot of interest from large multinational energy corporations who to think about what will be the fuel of the future, where do we go on the globe to produce renewable fuels from wind and solar, and so there I think the question is not yet answered, will it be pure hydrogen in liquefied form, or methanol, or ammonia, or liquid organic hydrogen carriers, so this is an open race right now, and we are waiting for the first big player to really put money into this. <laughs> and what I observe is that we are always fearing the big players from China, but they don't come to the international market. Let's, say, let's take the battery electric vehicles, you know, you have so many cheap battery electric vehicles in China, very affordable, you know, and we are, we are aching for, for some affordable cars, but you just come to our market. Why not, Mr. Chu? Uh, well, uh, uh, it is uh, like this, I think, just uh, as my uh, personal experiences, uh, because of the um, uh, air pollution. Uh, so our city is about uh, 130 meter, uh, 30 kilometers from Beijing. So air pollution also very serious. So in our city, uh, one uh, car, one plate, uh, one week only. Only there is one day you cannot uh, drive on the on the street with an internal combustion engine. Yeah, uh, only one day a week. Uh, one day in the week cannot uh, drive on the on the street. Okay, not allowed. So so some some people they, they just have two cars. One car is a gasoline car. Another car is electrical car. Electrical car in our city you can buy for uh, no no and no. And you get a plate. Uh, you, no no worry about the plate. Uh, so my sister uh, bought an electrical car. It's very cheap. About uh, I think about uh, 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 RMB is about uh, sixty thousand. Six sixty thousand how, yuan. How many uh, euro would that be? Well, 2000, I think. 2000. Uh, yeah, 2000 yeah. euro for an electric car. Yeah. Uh, what, what, uh, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 000, uh, less than yeah. 10,000. Less, okay, a little less than 10,000. Less than Still 10, cheap. Oh. It is cheap, but uh, if the electric car, uh, if, uh, for example, if there is a running, and uh, if for gasoline car, uh, there is uh, water into the car, then uh, you do not uh, start the engine, then, then, then the car can run again. The gasoline car, but the electric car, no. And also, if the electric car, you, you wanted to change the battery. Uh, also, uh, from the car manufacturer, uh, they have a subsidiary from the government. So, so when you buy the car, it's uh, uh, very cheap. But if you want to change something, of electric car, well, it's very high. Okay, and if you want to enter the European markets, you have to change uh, something, yeah. Uh, yeah. Mr. Chen. So that's, that's the reason why we don't see a lot of Chinese electrical cars here on our streets yet. I think it's uh, still too early for the Chinese to come to European country. Just uh, look at your cell phone. Your cell phone 10 years ago, nobody knows Huawei. Uh, nobody knows Xiaomi. But today, Huawei sell their cell phone in Europe quite well. So it I takes time. It takes time. <laughs> okay, we are waiting for that. So maybe this also happens to fuel cell cars then, yeah. Mr. Lena. Then probably we are in, uh, well, it's, it's, a, it's a risk a little bit that, that we lose this technology and also well, the advantage we have uh, in this technology very quickly. Yeah, I wouldn't be too pessimistic, um, even if the, the big car companies are not pushing it in Europe at the moment, which is a disappointment. Um, at the same time, we see a lot of the tier one suppliers, um, Forisia, Bosch, Plastic Omnium, um, Eldrin Klinger, and many others who are very, very actively embracing fuel cells as an opportunity to grow in the future. 
and to be part of that story in, in China as well. So if you look at the global automotive industry, I think the European players do have a chance to, to make a difference um, and, and be part of that growth in, in China. Um, it would be beneficial if we had a market in Europe for vehicles, which we currently don't really have. But if not, they, they just could go to China and make, uh, make their market there, couldn't they? <laughs> well, this is the whole story about joint ventures, and um, yeah, you, you, you're better off partnering with someone local. Um, it's now an interesting stage of transition where, because it happens so quickly, the Chinese fuel cell companies very often partner with global fuel cell actors like Ballard and Hydrogenics and others. Um, they're also attracting a lot of um, uh, um, staff from these companies. So, for example, a fuel cell expert who has spent 10 years with a traditional fuel cell company and now sees China, he can finally put his ideas into products that will be on the road in a year from now. That is an, an interesting opportunity for, for skilled experts. So, um, yeah, it, how big our part of the cake will be is to be seen. It really is, but you still have to make joint ventures, Mr. Chen. If, if I do, want to do business in, in China, I, I need a partner, and uh, we have to go into a joint venture, and they always have more than 50%. Uh, not really. Just, again, take a sample about Tesla. Tesla is the first uh, car manufacturer in China who could won 100% share of their company. So China is began to have a reform to accept all kinds of investment to develop the technology. So, uh, in uh, terms of the trade war with the United States, they also changed policy as, as far as I know. You don't have to uh, have a uh, joint venture where the Chinese company has more than 50%. Is that true? Not anymore. Yeah, Not anymore. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's true. Good to hear. So, what to do, Mr. Chi? If I want to make business in China, uh, I come to you and say, well, make a joint venture with me. Well, Are you ready for that? <laughs> well, uh, actually, I think uh, if you do uh, business in uh, China, it's better uh, first, uh, no matter what about the, the, the law or something like that, because it's a different uh, culture. Uh, I think it's better that uh, first you have a local partner. Then you, 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 you see what happened there. Things change very fast. If you have a local partner, they're familiar with the policy, familiar with the government, then it will be easy for, for, for doing business in China. If you only yourself, well, I think it's difficult. Yeah, so, so use the chance and also the opportunity that you have, uh, we have the Hydrogen and Fuel Cells Asia, which will uh, take place in Shanghai this October. Uh, as maybe that's the first step into the Chinese market. I recommend that to you. I would like to thank you all for your good questions. I would like to thank my panel for this discussion here. You can find the booth of Tianjin Mainland Hydrogen Equipment at E46, which is just over there. And uh, we'll, you can find Palkan Energy Corporation also at E63 down the aisle this direction. So visit them at their booth. Make joint ventures with them, maybe if they are ready or not, <laughs> you will find out. I would like to thank you all for being here. Thank you very much for, for this interview. Goodbye. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.